Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Karina Rotenstein. I'm the programmer of the TIFF Industry Conference, and uh, welcome to the second in our masterclass series. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes, just a reminder, no photography or video recording, but rest assured we are live streaming all of these to our website, and uh, will be up later on YouTube. And of course, you can uh, be tweeting. There'll be a lot of exciting things happen discussed here today, so feel free to tweet. Um, also, on your way in, you received a headset, uh, tr so we have simultaneous translation in effect. So just a little recap, channel one, English, channel two, Mandarin. Everyone's got it? Beautiful, excellent. Well, welcome to our masterclass with director, writer, producer, actor, and cinematic visionary, China's leading filmmaker, Feng Xiaogong. His body of work is includes a robust, uh, a robust work of romantic comedies, stirring dramas, big budget epic films, and uh, his directorial credits include The Dream Factory, Be There or Be Square, Assembly. His features Big Shot's Funeral and Aftershock played both, uh, both played at the Toronto Film Festival. Aftershock was China's entry for the Academy Awards. And uh, the how many people have seen Aftershock? Just out of curiosity. Those first 20 minutes, like they, they still resonate with me to this day. Uh, he, is here, I, he is here marking the world premiere of I Am Not Madame Bovary, and it is screening at TIFF's special presentations program. Uh, hosting today's masterclass is Patrick Freiter. He is a 20-year veteran writing about and analyzing the international film industry with publications including Variety and Screen International. He is the Asian, uh, Asia editor for Variety, and please join me in welcoming to the stage host Patrick Freider and, of course, Feng Xiaogong. Let's test the microphone. Who can hear me? Any? Yes, it works. Uh, thank you, Karina, for the introduction. Um, it's my very great pleasure to be here. Um, we have Feng Xiaogang, as Karina has already told you. He's got quite a few credits. Um, for my money, he's the most interesting, successful, and diverse uh, filmmaker working in China today. Um, and he is one of the reasons I became interested in Chinese cinema in the first place. So it's my very great pleasure to spend the next 50 minutes or an hour sitting here chatting together, pretending you're not there, um, and asking lots of questions, um, and hopefully discovering a little bit about uh, Feng Xiaogang, his latest film, and his career journey. Um, my first question is really a, 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 an easy question about um, Madame Bovary. I, I am not Madame Bovary. I watched the film a couple of days ago. It was incredibly impressive. Um, and yet, you have so many things to say. It's a, it's a, there's a lot to digest. You have so many targets. You're looking at corruption, small town officials, the difficulties of the legal system, men. Which of those targets is the most important for you? Uh. This is this character because he she had suffered this particular injustice, or what she perceives as a this particular injustice, um, she then have to face this whole system. This is the story was about. Um, basically, this woman has to face the system. He, Uh, 
I really, really like this novel for the reason that、um, Liu Zhenyun is a writer that he has a very, very humorous take to stories, and so a lot of. Authors, when they are facing a difficult scenario, tend to have a、uh, melancholy or、uh, a pessimistic approach to portraying the story. But Mr. Liu has a very humorous one. And I immediately chatted about the film with with some of my friends, and they said, "Yeah, this is a, a film that Feng Shuigang has been building up to make." All his career is that is that true at all? Ah, is this film? Yes, it is true.、Uh, there's been about five to six years since I read the novel until the movie came out. So it's, it's been a It's been a while, and I really like this kind of a dark humor that this、um, novel and this whole film carries. Want to get? Why did you want to 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 make this?、Um, so,、uh, and I'm really asking you here to to take us from the beginning of your career to to where we are today, because you've told me in the past that. And、you have a different journey to to most Chinese filmmakers. I think. Um, each for each director, his first film is very important. My first film, I made a major mistake because I think、um, for a first-time filmmaker,、uh, doesn't matter、um, how many mistakes that you make in your first film.、Um, you need、um, to have. Something.、Um, what you have is that you're supposed to have your own unique viewpoint. You have to have that unique viewpoint and unique voice, and also you're supposed to have a、um, way of carrying、um, carrying this film and presentation and in a unique way as well. And unfortunately,、um, uh, my first film, I wanted to portray myself a very mature director, so I didn't do as much of those two points as I just mentioned. So your first film as director was was an attempt to be commercial. Sorry, no problem. I, I, I want to continue. But I in this 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 now I'm almost sixty. But now I'm almost sixty. I have done many films. I start to have more and more of a realization that I need to make films that is. Of my own unique viewpoint, that has a, my own unique portrayal, and this is a unique.、Um, uh, a, and this is、uh, somewhat different.、Um, I think、um, for a lot of other directors, they came from a unique point、uh, and then matured, and I basically came from a mature director and now to a more individualist director. You're talking here about your first film as director, but in fact, you were also involved in the film industry before that. You worked as a stage designer, and you were also a writer.、Uh, what took you into directing? Uh, I started as I started as a, a I did stage design, artistic design. I it wasn't a lot of people 
who start as directors at that point. So I did artistic design, and then I did uh, writing, and then it gradually transferred in, transformed into directing. So uh, when I was doing artistic designing, I was great. And also when I was doing script writing, I was a great script writer. I wrote three scripts, all three of them got made into movies and, and did well. So basically, became before I became a director, I was already very familiar with uh, a lot of different type of work in filmmaking, and that really gave me a different experience as a director. We've, 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 we've heard about your diversity, both in Karina's introduction and my opening remarks. You do seem to have... Um, worked on, on, a, on a vast range of films from comedies through to dramas and even war films we've seen at assembly um, and melodramas and others. What explains that kind of range and which do you feel most comfortable with? Uh. At the beginning, I thought doing um, comedy is the most comfortable for me. Uh, I enjoy the writing, I enjoy the production, and I thought um, that was the most comfortable for me. Um, and later on, I have changed a little bit. I think I'm a little bit more cynical, so I think um, my mood when I'm making uh, comedy changed and also I wanted to try different things and that's also part of the reason why I, I start doing other things uh, you, you've become uh, you were at one stage in your career known as the uh, director who almost single-handedly created the Chinese New Year celebration movie uh, what is that genre? what is that genre it's a very special genre Because of, about 20 years ago, the Chinese film industry wasn't doing very well at all. The uh, audience left. Uh, they a lot of movie theaters uh, turned into bars and clubs, and at that time, um, uh, a lot of TV shows were really, really popular. Uh, most people stayed home and watched television shows. So a lot of um, movie directors uh, changed career and became uh, be, became um, a TV production uh, directors um, there's a few there was a few uh, movie director left uh, uh, were still doing um, uh, movies but they did a lot of uh, artistic movies and that was the time when I decided to make more movies and that's when I uh, start to do uh, comedies and uh, the comedies will be done and put into a market just around uh, New Year or Chinese New Year period and those are comedies that I made and so that gradually brought the audience back to the cinemas and the Chinese film industry um, happens to uh, grow again around that time and so now the Chinese film industry had grown to be so big and it is only second to the American film industry and um, so uh, when I first started the whole box office of a year is about 50 million and now it's about um, it's it was about 500 million and now it's about 50 billion it was a hundred times more so um, the audience are really uh, start 
to uh, change their viewing habits and they're really um, uh, start to watch films. So now, because it's so hot, um, there's more and more people are doing films. And so now there's a lot of people investing uh, films and a lot of people uh, who were doing finances before are now telling directors to make more films and how to make films. So there's a lot of very commercialized films. Um, so that's when I start to make films that I think are a little less commercial and I think are great stories that I think are going to be great films. Um, because I've done a lot of films and I have a lot of trust in people. And so therefore, I'm fortunate enough to get investments to do films that I think are great. And so this is how it, uh, how it happens. And precisely on that theme of trusting people, I wonder if I could sort of ask you about some of the, the continuities in your career, having asked you a moment ago about diversity, I now want to ask you about continuity. Um, one of the uh, relationships you've had in the film industry most regularly has been with the actor Go Yo, and one of the other uh, continuing themes has been working with, this, with the screenwriter, or often, but not always, uh, Wang Shuo. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us about those two relationships. I think there are two Chinese writers who had a lot of influence on my film. One is Wang Shuo, another one is Liu Zhenyun. And this is the uh, Liu Zhenyun is the writer for this current film. And a lot of uh, the uh, um, comedy I did before uh, were written by Wang Shuo. Uh, these are two. Uh, very significant and influential writers in the Chinese literature scene right now. And the uh, two of them are different, uh, but they have a very common, um, they have a very strong character in common, which is they're both extremely funny people, very humorous people. And how I, that's how I started uh, my filmmaking was because there's a lot of satire uh, in the humor and people, uh, the audience loved it. it it's, uh, it's, it's a different type of comedy. It's not a Jim Carrey type of comedy. It's not a Hong Kong type of comedy. My comedy is a different type of humor. Uh, and even in 1942, a movie uh, of that nature, it's still a very humorous film. Um, Ge Yu is a, um, uh, a person I work with a lot. Uh, he's a film star. Um, audience loves him. Why did I work with him so much? And it's because we work together so well. Ge Yu and I, we just really get each other. He really gets what we are doing. He understands why we do this character this way, Why what exactly we are trying to portray. So he really gets us, and, and that's why we work really well together. And that's why we uh, did so much together, and, and, and the co collaboration lasted so long. And, and does Ge Yu have an influence on, on, on the writing of, of, of the script, or does he just turn up on the day and, and, and perform to, uh, to what you want to do? Oh, no. We me and Geo, we, we work together uh, in, uh, in uh, a lot, and we, we do it in different ways. Sometimes we will just be having a drink together, and we talk about the story. And I talked to him about why I like the story and what I think of the character. And, uh, and he, he gives me feedbacks. And, and uh, those talks can happen during the writing of the script. And uh, 
uh, and then at the end, uh, he would be very, very familiar with the uh, the story and with the characters that I portrayed. I wonder if you could tell me just a little bit more about your writing process. Um, <coughs> you work with other screenwriters, or do you lock yourself in a dark room and, and tell nobody to bother you for five for five weeks? Uh, how does it work for you? We usually have a, a we, we, I'm usually used to uh, maybe two people or a small group of people write together, and that makes the process extremely interesting. I give a couple of examples. Uh, one, it's called uh, uh, Big Shot's Funeral. Uh, um, that is basically comes from a joke from at the dinner table. Uh, why would I say it was a joke at a dinner table? It was uh, uh, because um, uh, because around that time, um, all of a sudden, like in uh, on the street. Uh, in the elevator, uh, everywhere, you start to see ads. And that was um, something that was very new to us because we didn't have uh, so many commercials and so many ads before. And so our life uh, became somewhat different to be bombarded with all these ads. And a lot of people realized that, but no one said anything about making a movie about it. So um, so I was talking about it at dinner table and said um, um, marketing people, um, advertising people are so, so uh, um, uh, happening and, and they're doing stuff everywhere. So I was joking about um, what about a funeral? Would they try to uh, uh, do commercials and put in ads and do things uh, on a funeral car, on a, on a on, on casket, uh, how, what about, uh, uh, how about uh, the uh, uh, dresses of the, of the dead uh, and the uh, what, uh, sunglasses, what kind of shoes. And so I, we, we, we were actually just talking about it sort of jokingly. And then we thought, wait, we can actually make a movie. So that's the um, we that's the movie we asked uh, Donald Sunderland to come and act in the movie. So that script came from a uh, basically a, a funny a funny topic or a funny conversation at dinner table. And so um, everyone add and, and, and their input at the dinner table and everyone talked about how could it be more absurd and so on. And so it was actually a very interesting process uh, to uh, made it into an idea. So, so that was um, a very uh, typical uh, creative process, and we we just basically we only took a few days. Whenever we eat together, we just try to talk about what's the funny aspect of that, and uh, and we just kept in that theme. Um, the second, the second uh, example was the film uh, Cell Phone. Uh, and before that, um, I was working on a different script, uh, and the script wasn't going well. And um, so one day I got everyone together for a meeting, and uh, and Liu Zhenyun was there too, and uh, the uh, meeting of the the meeting was about that script, and are we going to continue that script? But everyone who was kind of somewhat disinterested, disinterested in that script, and so everyone was playing on their cell phone and talking on their cell phone. Some people was hiding uh, from the group and and do things on their cell phone. So. So I realized that a lot of people have a lot of things in their 
cell phone that uh, kept a lot of their secrets and perhaps a lot of lies. So this cell phone, which is in your hand, in your pocket, uh, it's no longer a cell phone. It's it's like a, a bomb because you have more and more secret in your cell phone. So one of these days, some information in the cell phone will explode. Um, so I felt as the, at the same time when the cell phone is create a very a convenience for, for, for everyone, but at the same time, it creates a huge uh, possible disaster. So our, our meeting, that meeting about that script, that didn't go well at all. And, and so we basically said, let's not continue this meeting about this script. Let's to talk about cell phone and can we uh, do a film about cell phones and how they uh, how about uh, that's connecting with people's secrets and privacies and lies and and Liu Chenyun got very excited and so we start uh, imagining uh, what this uh, main character should do um, so we thought about what would be the funnest, funniest or the most fun job for a person who has cell phone secrets. So we decided uh, that he's going to be a television host, and he's hosting a television program about telling the truth. So I thought this is a very um, good contrast, and so that's how we decided to um, make this main character to be this um, television host, and uh, we uh, uh, basically uh, wrote the story from there. And after this film came out, uh, it was very, very well received, and all the audience ran to this, ran to the. Um, cinema um, and everyone watched this we all watched uh, they all watched the film and then so the funny part was that a lot of male audience went to the bathroom uh, in the middle of the film and why did they went to the bathroom in the middle of the film because they went to delete things in their cell phones <laughs> So that was a very, very interesting um, phenomenon. Um, so the uh, box, office, box office was great, but on the other hand, a lot of male audience uh, criticized me and said, why do you have to do this? And so, so what happens was uh, um, a lot of male audience ended up going to the movie and uh, they, they, they watch it first and then afterwards they told their wives and girlfriends and says, uh, um, it's, ter it's a terrible movie, don't watch it. And then the wife and the girlfriend will say, oh, but my friends saw it and, and they, they said it was a great movie and uh, also it can uh, tell what man has in their cell phones and what kind of secrets they kept. So, uh, so uh, there was a lot of uh, 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 happened, a lot of situation happened was the man would go see the movie first by himself and then they would be dragged to see the movie again by their wives or girlfriends. So um, the, so um, this, uh, basically my example is that this story of the cell phone, it comes from life. It comes from very realistic life. And so um, I think it is important to, um, we, a script has to come from real life. Uh, I think uh, it's um, would be a very, very uh, different, um, and I think actually I'm afraid to have scripts that come from um, fabrication. Uh, I think um, I, I don't generally like, I generally don't like films that comes from fabrication. With one example, one uh, exception, which is Hollywood. They're very, very good at fabricating stories that will never happen. <laughs> um, what is it about the, the script and the film Notting Hill that you admire? I know you've, you've praised this film a few times. 
And when I was living in London, there was a story that you went to Notting Hill, the area, the district, looking for the uh, place where the film had been shot. Is that true? <coughs> Yeah. I didn't really go to see the sets, or, uh, but um, I was actually trying to do home renovation. I need about over 10 doorknobs and, um, and door handles. So um, I really like the old English style. Uh, uh, door uh, door handles. So that's why I went in that area in Notting Hill, in Notting Hill to look for uh, door handles for my house. But I, I, th I think you're not even telling the whole truth here. I think there's more to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe you're also working now with Duncan Kenworthy, who was the producer of that movie. Uh, what is it you're working on together? So, um, after that all had happened, um, I was a, a juror at the Shanghai Film Festival and happened to be another juror there that was this English uh, gentleman and Duncan, and he and I became good friends, and he said he really, really loved uh, a world without thieves, and he was hoping to be able to do a English version of uh, a world without thieves. So he and I talked about it, and we talked about writing the script, and I went to London. We just became very good friends. I really like his films. I, I really love Nording, uh, Notting Hill, and I really, really love um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. And I think his film uh, has, um, I think his film has a very interesting, could have a very interesting influence on Chinese films, because I think a lot of Chinese film uh, filmmakers right now want to do very Hollywood Wood type of movies, uh, a lot of special effects, sci-fi, uh, but I think um, an English director um, and I th has a very different approach. And I think um, perhaps the Hollywood approach is not necessarily the best approach for Chinese filmmakers. I think um, Hollywood films now is a huge, huge monumental peak when it comes to that type of films. And this monumental peak has a big shadow. So um, then people would ask, why do you want uh, to follow that trend? And you became somebody who follows that. So um, to spend a lot of money and time to uh, produce a film that Hollywood is good at, I don't think that is a good approach for a Chinese filmmaker. I think um, I think Chinese audience wants um, good films that is a Hollywood type, but then they can then watch a Hollywood movie. And the Chinese audience also want watch films that's closer to the Chinese life, then that is the type of film Chinese filmmakers should be making. And that's also what I always wanted to be making. I want, for example, this movie, uh, I Am Not Madame Bovary. This is a very uniquely Chinese film. This is something that could only happen in China. This is a story that would never happen anywhere else in the world. That, that, that's a very good point, and I, and I hope we can now queue up um, a, a little bit of the a little bit of the film. I'm told there's a delay of five seconds, so I have to keep talking for a moment or two. But this this trailer should come up any moment now. <coughs>
in case there are people who haven't yet seen the movie who are here and are interested, nevertheless, in Feng Shao Gang, could I ask you the obvious and stupidly obvious question, why the round format for most of the film, though sometimes you also change the format to square and even a couple of widescreen shots? <coughs> When I first got the script, you must have you must have heard of uh, Mr. Zhang Yimou did uh, did a story that was called Chou Ju, um, and I um, and one could see uh, some similarities. So um, I wanted to make a film that would be quite different from that. So I thought about it and I thought. Uh, his film was extremely realistic. It was very, very accurately portraying what was happening in China at that time. And it was very, very realistic, but at the same time, it was very bizarre. So I was thinking, is it because the uh, story was bizarre, or is it because the, um, um, or is it because uh, the portrayal of it was bizarre? I mean, nowadays it's very popular. You want to carry a. A, a, a camera and you follow the actor everywhere um, and something very direct. Um, so I want to do something different from that. So I wanted to do something uh, people do not do. So I so just at that time, I saw uh, a Canadian filmmaker, Roland, and he did a movie called Mommy. And so um, that per, uh, that um, uh, director himself did a film and it was square. So I said, okay, I'm not doing the square thing. I'm gonna do a round thing then. And so I told the, uh, uh, the um, uh, cinematographer that I'm gonna do a round one and everyone was against it because they said, "Oh, this is this is horrible idea. You're gonna be offending the audience." So that got me really excited. So I said to myself, "All these years, I'm trying to please the audience. I'm trying to understand what they want. So now I want to actually do something different. So I want to do something other people don't do. And if this, if it, if something." You have an idea. Everyone thought it was a great. Everyone thought it was a great idea. Then someone must have done it before. And if you have an idea, and everyone thought, no, 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 that's a horrible idea. You can't do it. That most likely is an idea that people haven't done before. So if we just do a wide screen, um, and then creatively you do a possible thing to a possible thing and do a round thing, it, you're doing a impossible thing to a possible thing. So would it be more meaningful to make possible thing to be possible? Of course, it would be more meaningful to do an impossible thing to a possible thing. Uh, and, and as a storytelling device, how do you how do you use it? Because some scenes, as I say, most of the scenes are round, but there are square ones as well. Uh, I think this story, Li Xueyuan's story. I said already, it's extremely Chinese story. And I think this round shape, um, it's also uh, very Chinese. You've seen it in a lot of ancient Chinese uh, paintings. Uh, and round uh, shape of painting is something that has a very uh, deep connection with Chinese uh, uh, ancient paintings. So it just has a a Chinese feel to it, and it gives the film a Chinese feel. And then I thought about it, uh, do I want the whole film to be round? And so that's when I thought, um, I want it to be two different parts. Um, I want um, the, um, what happened 
Americans in uh, at her hometown. Um, the hometown uh, uh, scenes will be round. And then she went to Beijing. Um, Beijing is a very different city. It's a huge city. It's a very different physical presence from her hometown. So that's um, that's why we did a square one. When she, we did a square when she was in Beijing. And it also, I think, the round one feel less compatible with power, with something that is um, a very strong element. So that's why uh, we, we chose to do uh, square ones at times. Um, so I also feel round and I also feel circles and squares feels like more basic, uh, basic uh, uh, shapes, um, a rectangle or a or a uh, oval feels like an extend extension of circle and square, and so also in Chinese um, speech, there's also um, a um, word that refers to square and circle, meaning uh, rules and uh, meaning uh, senses. So. Um, those two words are uh, interesting to to be, and also I think another aspect is that um, China had a long, long history, thousands of years of history of uh, people interacting and people's. Uh, humanity um, regulating the society. So that has this round feel to it, is people are uh, rounded and, and uh, it, it's a very smooth and subtle interaction. But recent China, we're trying to get into a more law-abiding society. Uh, it's to uh, the rule of law. Um, so. Um, that's, a, um, an, that's an interesting transformation that's happening in this story. Is a, a, we're portraying a society that is transforming from a more uh, governed by humans to more governed by law. So that also has this meaning to the square and the circle. So in future, we're all going to be square Beijingers, I think. Um, the film uh, is incredibly up to date. Um, you, you, we've only, only in the last week or two, we've been hearing about couples in Shanghai getting divorced so they can play the property game better. <clears throat> the rule of law, which you've just mentioned, is a favorite topic of Chinese President Xi Jinping. And I wondered how much you had to update things from the book to, to make them as current as they are in this film. Um, I'm not sure I understand what you mean uh, in your question. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask you a different question, but it's all very, very similar. Um, <clears throat> topicality, making things up to date, uh, seems to be one of the, the great strengths of your movies. It was certainly true of Cell Phone, which we talked about a moment ago, and uh, one of your most successful comedies, uh, If You Were the One, <laughs> is incredibly up to the minute, up to date. Uh, is, is this something that you very actively seek to do, to be almost up to the day when you make your movies? Yes, yes. I think I think, I think a lot of people say they would want to make a, a, a film that is happening in ancient China. That would be easily passed by uh, the censor. So I think, um, I think 
Um, we are in a time that China is going through huge changes, and I think it has to have films portraying those huge changes. We have to record these changes. We cannot run away from these changes uh, or avoid these changes. I think to um, do films about these changes obviously has its risks, um, but I think we have to do them so that people later on can see these films and really have an idea of what it's like, uh, what, uh, what China was like in the 80s and the 90s, and what China was like in the first 20 years of the 21st century. So if you look at my movies uh, from the first He Sui Pian, and you can see my movie is have always grown with the changes that has happening in China. And so um, these movies excites me. To, to make these movies excites me. And I can easily tell. I can easily tell and say to this actor or the, this actress, oh, no, no, that, that's off. This is not real, realistic. But if I make, a, if I make a, a movie about ancient China, I'm not sure how a man should uh, behave and therefore how an actor should act in uh, portraying a character in ancient China. But to do a, a very up-to-date character, it's very easy for me to, to say what exactly what I want to portray. So what were, what were you doing then in Aftershock, where uh, the film is, 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 it takes place at three, three different periods? Uh, there, there, there's a time when you almost seem to be standing back and, and admiring the speed of change in China. I'm, I'm not sure. Do you think the aftershock has anything? I mean, aftershock is a story that I had personally experienced as well, even though it's set it in the 70s last century. But it's still a topic that was something I'm very familiar with. And I mean, I'm almost 60. So I had a lot of experiences uh, in different stages of China. I mean, I experienced a China that was the poorest, have the least material wealth. And I'm also now experiencing the China that is uh, a lot um, wealthier. And But I think um, each period of China has its stories to tell and all, all worth, uh, worth worthy uh, stories to tell. Let's bring you back to, to I'm Not Madame Bovary. There, there are times when um, you put people in ludicrous situations. We saw part of that in the, in the clip a moment ago. At other times, the film uses uh, language, phrases that could come almost straight out of the propaganda department about attitude, just attitudes towards the masses, needing to look after small matters as well as large. And yet, you seem to use them with a, a double meaning. Is that, is that your intention? We did we worded those particularly. Uh, we, we worded those particular ways of those uh, um, for, for, um, for, for, for particular purposes. We, we, we deliberately did that. Uh, Chinese um, audience would have a very good reaction to that because they really hears it in, in their own lives. So that's why um, the Chinese audience would really 
uh, react to it the way I want them to. Uh, I think Chinese audience would react differently to uh, uh, very differently to um, uh, foreign audience because foreign audience don't have these personal experiences and they don't hear these words in their own lives. So um, we try to. Uh, we try, it's, it's difficult to uh, translate uh, how these, um, a lot of these uh, Chinese scripts to English. We, we, we really thought about it very, very hard because on one hand, uh, we have to sort of um, put um, a very dense uh, dialect to something a little bit easier uh, for the foreign audience to digest. But on, the, uh, but on the other hand, the foreign audience are just a sophisticated audience as well, um, but um, they are, um, they are, uh, they just have different um, experiences when it comes to uh, Chinese vocabulary. So, uh, so therefore, uh, my movies, uh, which is the richest part of my movies, is the script. Um, um, for example, um, uh, maybe I can I can do a, a, an example. If you want to, to translate Woody Allen's film. And if you want to translate that uh, to something very simple, I think it lost a lot of its richness. And so um, I think that also happens to my film when, it, when you translate it. What, <coughs> what do you have left to do in cinema? And it's a strange question, but what, do you, what ambition do you, do you have uh, remaining? You've got so many accolades. You've got handprints in the, in, the, in the cement in Hollywood. You've been compared with Steven Spielberg. You've made lots of money. Um, and you've recently revived your acting career with a starring role in Mr. Six. What else do you want to do? Uh, <laughs> There are still a lot of stories. For example, a lot of uh, directors have done um, their uh, stories about their youth, for example. Um, I've never done one of those. So I, what I want to do next is to do a story perhaps closer to my youth, um, a little bit more of an autobiography type of a film. So that's something I'm preparing to do next year. And, and I believe you've recently signed with a, an American talent agency. And are you you're looking to work in Hollywood as well? Not quite. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the talent agent uh, approaches uh, approaches me as if, hey, if you don't have anybody representing you, um, maybe we can represent you, uh, just in case you have something to do. And um, but so far, I don't really have that much to do. Um, I don't have that much to do with Hollywood. I don't think Hollywood need me. I don't know what I can do there. I, I don't even speak English. <laughs> well, it seems you, you still have a talent for making people laugh, even in translation. Um, and a moment ago, you said you have lots of stories uh, left to tell. Unfortunately, we don't have lots of time left. Um, th there will be plenty of occasions for Feng Shaogang to come back to Toronto, I believe, um, with his next several stories. Um, so I'm going to say thank you very much indeed and thank you for being so patient with us.